Okay, hello everybody who is out there in YouTube world. Thank you so much for joining us at Climate Change is Affecting Your Health. My name is Mary Ellen. I'm going to be your MC, your host tonight, and I'm really, really happy to be here. It's going to be a really cool event we have planned tonight. So before we get going, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. So we would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the ancestral lands and waters of the Anishinaabe Mississauga people on lands covered by the Williams Treaty and Treaty 20. We respectfully acknowledge that those who have walked, sorry, we respectfully acknowledge those who have walked on the earth before us, those who walk on it now and future generations who may, who have yet to walk upon it. May we gain strength and wisdom so that all may continue to treat the land, water and all living things with honor and respect. And may we not forget that we are all treaty people and we have obligations under those treaties. The overarching theme of today's event is a reminder for everyone to take care of our lands, waters, and the many plants and animals that live among us. We say miigwech to those indigenous to this land for sharing this land with those of us who are newcomers. So hello and welcome once again to Climate Change is Affecting Your Health. This is an event that was put together by four grandchildren in partnership with Peterborough Public Health. The purpose of this event is to raise awareness in the Peterborough, Peterborough community of the ways we are impacted by climate change locally and the ways this crisis of climate change is affecting our health. Climate change is no longer a threat looming in the future. It is here, it is already affecting us, and it is already causing damage to our communities. The effects of the climate emergency will only grow stronger with inaction from society. Human beings created this emergency and we are the ones who will fix it as well. I hope that tonight we can learn together and begin to understand the profound work ahead of us if we are to solve these problems and ensure a healthier, more sustainable future. So as I mentioned, um, this event is being hosted by the Local Climate Change Action Group for our grandchildren, or 4RG for short, uh, in partnership with the Local Public Health Unit, Peterborough Public Health. 4RG is a Peterborough-based climate action group whose mission is to inspire, inform, and mobilize people to take effective action in response to the climate crisis. We want to empower people to be part of the solution. I joined 4RG about a year ago, seeking opportunities to take action against the climate crisis in my community, which is also the Peterborough community. Um, and while I'm not a grandparent, I am a grandchild, as we all are, and the climate crisis does truly affect every single human being on this planet. Um, so uh, 4RG is not is a climate action group for all ages. You don't have to be a grandparent to be a part of it. Um, and I have met some really, really amazing people doing this work and being part of this group. I've gained a lot of valuable skills uh, in advocacy in activism, and I really look forward to continuing uh, to do this work and to share this journey with all these lovely people here. Um, Peterborough Public Health has partnered with us for this event, as I said. They have truly been instrumental in making this event the best it can be and making it possible, especially given the constantly changing threats levels from the pandemic. So they've been really helpful in guiding us through that and helping with all this technology stuff. It's been so lovely. Uh, the mission of the Public Health Unit is to work with partners to promote and protect the health of communities in Curve Lake and Hiawatha First Nations and the county and city of Peterborough. The health unit also came out with a new strategic plan this year in which they stated their intent to support climate change engagement in the community. So them uh, partnering with us with this event, it truly shows that the public health unit is taking their new plan seriously and putting their words into action. And it's really, really cool to see that. Um, so before we get into it, uh, I'm just going to go over some really quick housekeeping things. So this event is being held completely virtually due to the current state of the pandemic. We are in a high risk level in Peterborough right now though we would have loved to have a live audience. It just wasn't possible. Audience members had the opportunity to submit questions for the speakers through the Eventbrite link that they used to register. We've selected some questions to ask our speakers tonight from those that were submitted. We selected our questions based on most relevant topics and most frequently asked questions, so what, what people really wanted to hear about. Um, and we also have the media here uh, going to join us at some point tonight and they will also be invited to ask some questions. So I'm probably not going to have time to get through everyone's questions that were submitted. I'm sorry about that. Um, if your question was not asked during this presentation and you really would love an answer to it, you can direct that question to us via email and I'm going to put that email up on the screen at the end of the presentation. So 
you can copy it down and you can send us your questions, but the email is contact us at foregrandchildren.ca for anyone who wants it right now immediately. But again, it will be up on the screen later tonight. So um, without further ado, our first item tonight on this agenda is to hear from Janet McHugh, who is going to, well, we have a video actually of her. We were lucky enough to get a beautiful recording of Janet uh, singing in nature, which is where it truly really should be. Um, so I'm first gonna tell you a little bit about Janet. Janet McHugh is from Curve Lake First Nation. She's a longtime leader and advocate who dedicates her time to raising awareness for social, social justice, empowering the Aboriginal community, providing education to local schools and museums and supporting those marginalized by poverty. Janet was inducted into the Peterborough Pathway of Fame for Community Betterment and has received two civic awards for community and cultural betterment for Peterborough. She has also received the YMCA Peace Medallion. And Janet says that drumming and bringing community together is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. Janet is here with us on the call. I think she's still here. Uh, Janet, did you want to say a couple words about the song before we play the video? Sure. Uh, my spirit name is Starbeam Woman. The song that I'm singing is written by Nancy Johnson called We Come From the Water. And I'd like you to notice that uh, there's two native words in there. Uh, Nabi is water and Gizogan. I love you. So enjoy the song. Be watch. So you can go ahead and play. Thank you. She comes from the heart. She comes once was so clear, now clouded and poisoned, it lives in fear. The light flood the water, what's happened to you? You give a native. Till there's nothing left to do. How can they not see it? The harm that they do. It's time now to show them it's up to you. We hear you. Don't kill me, please stop. As they pour in the toxins from down river to the top, the trees know you're hurting. The trees feel your pain. They're you live again. We know you can heal yourself. And all you really need is just some help. Oh,
thank you so much, Janet. Watch, that was beautiful. That's uh, a really, really um, lovely way to to hear that music and to be reminded of the importance of connection to connecting to nature. Um, so I am going to now introduce our speakers, um, and I'm going to introduce both speakers. Uh, one after another, just because I know that their presentations are really going to connect nicely to each other, and I don't want to split up that lovely flow with me jumping in uh, to introduce. So I'm going to talk about both of our speakers, we're going to get to know them right now, and then we're going to listen to both presentations back to back. So uh, first, we're going to hear from Drew Monkman. Drew is a graduate of the Université Laval in Quebec City and the University of Toronto. He worked as a French immersion teacher until retiring in 2011. He is a lifelong naturalist and writer whose environmental columns have appeared in the Peterborough Examiner since 2004. Drew is the author of three books, including Nature's Year in the Quarthas and The Big Book of Nature Activities, which he co-authored with Jacob Rodenberg. Drew also maintains a website where he posts his columns, recent wildlife sightings, and information on climate change in the Quarthas. He's been a member of 4 rg since 2012 and is involved with other environmental groups such as Peterborough Pollinators, Peterborough Field Naturalists, and Pathway to, to Stewardship. In 2015, he received an honorary degree from Trent University. And Drew is going to talk to us tonight about how we are uh, being impacted here in the Peterborough area by climate change. After we hear from Drew, we're going to hear from Dr. Thomas Piggott. Dr. Thomas Piggott is the, the Medical Officer of Health and Chief Executive Officer of Peterborough Public Health. Dr. Piggott is a public health and preventative med medicine specialist and practicing family physician. He completed his master's in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and his residency training at McMaster University. He has experience in collaborative indigenous public health and in working at various levels of public health, both in Canada and internationally. Dr. Pickett has done meaningful work in the Northern Canadian region of Labrador Grenfell and has also worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo with Doctors Without Borders. Dr. Piggott is actively involved in research and teaching in public health at McMaster University and Memorial University. His research work has focused on guideline development and health equity. Dr. Piggott was the co-editor of the book Underserved Health Determinants of Indigenous Intercity and Migrant Populations in Canada, which was published in 2018. Dr. Piggott has advised in public health guideline development methodology for multiple organizations, including the World Health Organization, the European Commission, and the European Commission. Excuse me. He has advised on the board of directors for several organizations and task forces and currently sits on the board of directors of the Canadian Public Health Association. And Dr. Piggott, I believe, is going to talk to us about how climate change is impacting our health here in Peterborough. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how these two presentations connect to each other and give us a really cool local scope of how we're feeling climate change here. So now that we've gotten to know both our speakers tonight, please join me in welcoming Drew Monkman. All right. Can you hear me? Good to go. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much, Mary Ellen, and it's wonderful uh, to be here this evening. I'll uh, jump right into it. What I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, talk about some of the basic facts around climate change uh, on, a, you might say, on a planetary uh, level before we start looking at the, uh, at the local situation. I'll then look at uh, how temperatures are changing in Peterborough, precipitation, uh, what is being forecast for the future. But the bulk of my presentation really will be on how nature is being impacted now and how it uh, very well could be impacted uh, going uh, forward. I'll... Uh, wrap up by talking a little bit about things that we all can do uh, to address climate change and also look at some very uh, uh, important reasons I would say for for hope as we as we move forward. So let's go to the first slide. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, I can see the screen now. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to be reading a, a fair amount of text off uh, off of the slide. Um, 
This, uh, unfortunately, is, is a very uh, fact-heavy uh, subject area, so uh, we really need to to uh, deal with a lot of uh, a lot of numbers. So, um, right now, I think what's most important to know is that we are on course to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by the 2040s and probably two to three uh, Celsius degrees of warming by 2100. Even though this is a lot, and, um, and even though the fact that we're going to be moving uh, above 1.5 degrees of warming almost inevitably, it's really not quite as dire a situation as what was predicted just five years ago when uh, most scientists were saying that by the end of the century, century we could be looking at four to five degrees of, uh, of warming. And a lot of this has to do with some um, considerable action that's already been taken and the, the decreasing price of renew, renewable energy and um, <clears throat> more and more serious government policies. However, CO2 emissions uh, right now are still at their highest uh, or are at their highest level ever and will continue to grow probably for the next five years before starting to come down quite rapidly. The amount of atm atmospheric CO2 as well is growing. Just last week we were at four, over 416 parts per million up about uh, two parts per million from just a year ago, and really well above the pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million. The Paris uh, Climate Agreement goal of cutting emissions worldwide by 45% by 2030 into net zero by 2050, unfortunately is looking increasingly out of reach, but um, you know, I think a lot of in a lot of quarters they're still uh, holding out uh, out hope, especially with, with the number of the new programs that are, that are coming online. We should know too that observed warming and severe impacts are consistent with what computer models predicted. That uh, Canada is warming uh, much faster than the rest of the planet. We've warmed now by about 1.7 degrees uh, versus about 1.2 uh, for the planet as a whole. Climate change is making other ecological crises worse, uh, including uh, species extinction. But the good news is we know what the, sol the solutions are and we have most of the necessary technology. But despite uh, you know, considerable progress, the, um, the level of, of engagement um, is still not quite where we would like to see it. So, there's still lots of room for improvement. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, how have temperatures changed in Peterborough? Well, first of all, the mean annual temperature here has increased by about 1.8 degrees Celsius by, uh, since 1950. So uh, we're looking at an annual mean temperature of about 7.8 degrees. So pretty much in line with how much Canada as a whole has warmed. But what is particularly uh, uh, noticeable, uh, this is something I've been uh, tracking since 2010, is the average temperature, average mean, <coughs> sorry, the mean temperature for each month so since 2010, there have been twice as many warmer than average months than cooler than average. So by about a ratio of two to one, warmer than average months are outpacing cooler than average months. And the warmer than average months are considerably warmer, whereas cooler than average are just a little bit above average. So when you start looking at these uh, numbers over the last 10 years, it's, it's very evident that, uh, that things are warming up, warming up quickly. Um, we're seeing, uh, in particular, I'd say a lot of uh, warmer falls uh, with later frosts. It's interesting to note that um, we're now in, in mid-November 
And the average uh, temperature so far this month has been almost eight degrees Celsius compared to a normal of 1.7 uh, Celsius. So as much as we enjoy this warm weather, what we're seeing right now, at least up until uh, today, has been considerably uh, warmer than average. Um, and even as the climate warms, it's important to keep in mind that extreme cold, like what we saw this past winter, is still possible. And that this may be linked to a quickly warming Arctic, which is causing disruptions in the jet stream and allowing frigid air to spill southward. This is still an active area of study, but the fact that we, we still get this cold weather may indeed have a climate link to it. Next slide. So um, this is interesting. This is some um, data that, uh, believe it or not, has been gathered by the Bridge North Pharmacy going back to the 1880s on when um, the ice went out on Shimong Lake. So each of those uh, dots uh, represents the day of the year, uh, day one being January 1st, when the ice went out. And uh, there's a very clear tendency uh, showing later ice out. So in the 1880s, on average, the ice went out of Shimong on about the 110th day, around April 20th, 105th day in the 60s, and in the 2010s, it uh, has been going out on about the 95th day. So a full um, two weeks uh, earlier for ice out. And other information I've been able to track down shows uh, 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 sort of the flip side of this with freeze up with the lake freezing up about two weeks later, late December now, as opposed to early uh, January. Next slide. So here are some projections for uh, Peterborough. These projections are based on a business as usual greenhouse gas emission scenario. So essentially what we carry on as we're still carrying on today. However, I should say that uh, going forward, um, you know, we are going, we should be seeing significant reductions. So hopefully uh, some of the numbers I'm going to talk about right now will not be quite as uh, extreme. But the projection is that the annual mean temperature will increase from a baseline of about uh, 6 or 6.5 degrees Celsius to 8.6 in the 2030s and to 10.8 uh, Celsius in the uh, 2060s. And 10.8 is approximately the annual mean temperature in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So that's just sort of one way to think about um, the kind of temperatures that are coming our way. We're going to see a big uh, increase too in the, in the number of days above 30 degrees Celsius um, from a baseline of 10, which was the average in the 70s and 80s, increasing to 27 in the 2030s and maybe all the way up to 52 in the 1960s or 2060s. Greatest warming occurring in the winter. Um, a considerably longer uh, growing season, climbing to about 168 days by 2030. Not a huge change in precipitation, but the seasonal pattern is expected to change with um, wetter winters, more rain in the winter, also wetter springs, drier summers, and more days with heavy precipitation. So days with heavy precipitation events, as Peter Bro has already experienced uh, going back to 2002 and 2004. Um, Okay, next slide. So um, we are looking at um, more extremes, more wind storms. We got a taste of uh, what these, uh, uh, you know, intense wind storms can look like this spring. Um, more floods, uh, more droughts, more freezing rain. 
and more soaring summer temperatures. Already in 2018, we had uh, well over 20 days uh, above uh, 30 degrees Celsius and very similar scenario in the summer of uh, 2020 as well. So these warm summer temp temperatures are, are pretty disconcerting. Next slide. So I thought it was worthwhile putting in uh, one slide about the Durette show, the windstorm that we experienced on May 21st. Certainly the worst storm I think anyone living in Peterborough uh, has ever experienced. It wrought uh, huge damage to city parks, to Camp Kawartha, which lost 600 trees, to Stony Lake, the islands on Stony Lake, um, the Kawartha Land Trust properties, uh, the uh, cemetery on, on Little Lake, really uh, pretty devastating uh, damage. And you know, it wasn't just a, or it's not just a financial toll on people, but al also uh, an emotional toll. And I think this is something that's really important to keep in mind with climate change, is this eco grief that we experiencing, you know, we experience, you know, a lot of beautiful iconic trees in Peterborough, city trees, uh, park trees are now simply memories. And, um, you know, this is painful stuff. Uh, my heart goes out to the so many people that lost uh, very significant old trees on their property. And I've heard from so many cottagers on Stony Lake whose cottage property is now just completely different with the loss of, especially with the loss of white pine up there. So these direct shows require high levels of heat and moisture in the atmosphere. And uh, we're seeing these sort of atmospheric conditions more often, and these conditions are creeping northward. And a lot of scientists think that storms like this uh, are quite likely in the future. And they are a reminder of all we stand to lose by hesitating, at least, to commit to all out climate action. Next slide. So as a naturalist, um, I'm just going to run through some of the things that I'm seeing, some of the things that researchers at uh, Trent University are seeing, and um, go down a bit of a list of, uh, of, of what's happening, first of all, at the species level. So the big picture is that we're seeing the northward expansion of a host of birds, um, insects, mammals that previously, you know, were pretty much restricted to uh, far southern Ontario, maybe the north shore of Lake Erie. So this includes birds um, that we're now seeing here, breeding here, like hooded warblers, red-bellied woodpeckers. This is a new bird that people may be noticing at their feeders, gnat catchers, cardinals, insects like swallowtails, Canada's largest uh, butterfly dragonflies uh, that are new to the Quarthas, and also mammals like the opossum, the southern flying squirrel, the white-footed mouse, and now even uh, bobcats. And a lot of the work on mammals uh, has been done by Jeff Bowman at uh, Trent University. So he's documented the northern spread of southern flying squirrels and how they're hybridizing with uh, our native uh, northern flying squirrels, we're finding a lot of hybrid uh, flying squirrel species. He's also documenting how white-footed mice, the principal source of Lyme disease bacteria, are also spreading north. And also how lynx are contracting, or the lynx's range is, con is contracting northward. And that the lynx is being uh, slowly replaced by bobcats. So, Clearly, climate change is not the only factor involved here. There's a host of factors, but we can think of climate change as a multiplier or as an intensifier of other things that are happening as well. Okay. So at, at the same time as we're seeing southern species moving northward, uh, some of our uh, uh, iconic resident species, especially species found in northern uh, Peterborough County, uh, 
are themselves uh, retreating northward. They're moving north. So birds like the Canada jay, which used to be a fairly regular species in northern uh, Peterborough County around the petroglyphs and in Apsley. And uh, they think the reason why Canada jays are having trouble is because they actually hide food during the summer and fall to feed to their chicks. They have their chicks very early uh, in the spring when there's very little food uh, available. So this food that they're caching um, appears to be spoiling and thereby disrupting their uh, nesting uh, success. Uh, work done by Dennis Murray from Trent too is showing that that moose in Peterborough County are struggling. You know everything from winter tick uh, infestations due to uh, warmer winters, brainworm that they are contracting from deer. Brainworm will eventually kill the moose, um, not so the deer, but mostly just because they're not adapted to the warmer temperatures uh, we're seeing. Uh, even snowshoe hares are becoming increasingly rare and may disappear from uh, from Peterborough County. Next slide. So, um, yeah, on average now, many events are happening earlier in the spring than uh, than average, whereas others are happening later in the fall. So. On average, once again, not every year. We've had some very cool springs these last few years. But um, an MNR sh uh, study showed that the peak calling period for early breeding frogs like the leopard, leopard frog is now on average about 10 to 20 days earlier than it was in 1995. We're seeing a host of trees, wildflowers and shrubs blooming earlier. Um, including uh, ki uh, common lilac. Many years we see uh, migrants like the red-winged blackbird. These are birds, short distance migrants that really don't go any further than the central to southern uh, US coming back uh, a week or two early. Um, the concern, especially with birds returning early, is a potential mismatch between when the birds arrive and prepare to nest and when food resources are at their peak. If they get back too early um, or too late, and particularly too late in the case of birds coming from the tropics, they'll be here at a time when the peak food availability has already passed. And this is something that's being seen increasingly in Europe. In the fall too, um, I've already alluded to generally warmer falls, later frosts, uh, one study in New England uh, uh, showed that uh, peak color now across New Hampshire and Vermont is about a week later than it used to be in the 70s and 80s. And something else that's quite interesting is that these warmer temperatures <coughs> appear to be uh, dulling the colors. So many years we're not seeing quite the vibrant uh, display of colors that we saw in the past. I should say, though, that this year was an exception to that rule, we had really stellar conditions in September and October for good color. And um, and we were really treated to quite a uh, quite a display this year, which was uh, wonderful to see. OK. So with um, higher levels of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere and a longer uh, growing season, this is really having an impact on some plants. So one thing we're seeing, for example, is that pollen levels are increasing, as is the length of the pollen and allergy season. Pollen, or sorry, uh, uh, Poison ivy and ragweed are really thriving right now, partly because they respond more than many other plants do to higher carbon dioxide levels. Not all plants respond to higher carbon dioxide the same way. So ragweed pollen production has more than doubled in many parts of Canada, 
And uh, in many areas, uh, the growing season is also much longer, I believe up to 25 days longer in Winnipeg. And I'm sure it's uh, in that neighborhood in Peterborough as well. So for people like me who suffer from hay fever, you know, it hasn't been great. Uh, it's creating bigger poison ivy plants with more urushil, the, uh, the oil that causes uh, the rash. Um, the uh, higher CO2 also seems to be favoring the growth and spread of invasive species, uh, even more so than native plants. So I'm sure people here this evening have noticed the proliferation of Phragmites and dog strangling vine, garlic mustard, uh, and a host of others. So they, they seem to be, uh, their growth really seems to be boosted by this higher CO2. Okay. And another uh, pretty well documented story is how uh, black legged ticks are, uh, are spreading north. So black legged ticks are the ticks that carry the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And they have now uh, spread into the Quarthus. And this is due uh, uh, mostly to longer and hotter summers, earlier springs, longer falls, and milder winters that increase their uh, rates of survival. The longer summers also mean a longer season in which ticks are active and also uh, in which uh, people are active. My sister-in-law had a tick on her, a black-legged tick that she picked up the first week of November uh, last year. So they are certainly out there. And I know Dr. Piggott will speak more about this. It doesn't mean that um, they all carry Lyme disease. In fact, I believe still a minority of the ticks are carrying the bacteria, but their numbers are certainly growing. And uh, something else that's changing too with climate change is that the range and abundance of animals that are hosts to ticks, the ticks have to have a host in order to survive. And one of their main hosts is the white-tailed uh, uh, deer. So white-tailed deer have, uh, uh, their numbers are, are increasing rapidly as are numbers of mice and especially the white-footed mouse that does in fact carry the bacteria for Lyme disease. Okay. Now, I think many people are interested in the decline in insect numbers. This is a complicated uh, question at just as to what is going on. I think people of uh, my generation at least can, uh, can relate to something called the windshield phenomenon. Uh, really up until maybe 20, 25 years ago, you'd go for a drive in the country on a summer night and you're, you'd come back and your windshield would be absolutely gummed up with uh, the remains of insects. Well, we almost never see, see that anymore. Our windshields are clear. So it's, that's just one sort of anecdotal way of, of, of you know, getting a sense of, of the decline in insects, especially in moths, uh, but also in beetles and, um, and uh, you know, other species as well. So this is also having an impact on birds, uh, such as swallows that, that feed on these insects. I think extreme weather is uh, killing insects directly, such as uh, late uh, spring rains, extreme weather events in the spring. And of course, we have to factor in uh, pesticide use, intensive agriculture, and uh, increasingly climate change. It's having a real impact on monarchs, both on their wintering grounds and during uh, migration. The good news, though, is that monarchs seem to be pretty, uh, pretty much able to to bounce back. And numbers last winter on their wintering grounds were actually quite, uh, uh, quite uh, a bit higher than than average. Okay. So looking to the future, you know, one big concern, especially for a naturalist, a birder such as myself, is uh, 
is the loss of bird diversity. Already we have 3 billion fewer birds in North America than we did in the 1970s, primarily as a result of habitat loss, but increasingly uh, climate change is becoming a factor. Um, Audubon in the US did a huge study several years ago that showed that at just 1.5 degrees of warming, it's going to be quite difficult for some species, uh, the uh, common loon, for example, to continue to uh, to breed in the Quarthas. So this, you could let, can literally go anywhere in North America use at the Audubon site and see, depending on the degree of warming, what species will be affected. So, um, you know, going forward, uh, we may no longer see a, a number of you know, somewhat common um, and uh, species that we presently see at our cottages or, or on the Quartha Lakes. Okay. But at the same time, uh, you know, just uh, not to uh, give the false impression that this is all doom and gloom, um, many bird populations are thriving, especially raptors, especially waterfowl, and also most of our resident birds. So um, it is a mixed picture. Okay, I'm going to speed up here. So there's considerable concern uh, looking forward as to the health of our forests, wetlands, and lakes. Um, you know, I think it's quite self-evident that extreme weather events like intense heat, drought, ice storms, wind storms, insect pests like the emerald ash borer, invasive species are extremely hard on our uh, forests. And also uh, by mid-century, mid -century, century, it's possible that we'll no longer have the temperature and precipitation regime for the forests that we have right now. And even trees like the sugar maple may find it difficult to uh, survive or to reproduce here. And uh, things are equally uh, dire for wetlands, especially because of their vulnerability to droughts and to floods and to invasive species. There's also a host of threats to lakes, uh, in addition to uh, cottage development and shoreline hardening and all of those things. Climate change means later freeze up, earlier ice out, warmer water meaning greater evaporation, so wa uh, lower water levels, and dealing with things like algal blooms and the proliferation of aquatic plants. So this will impact lake uh, diversity, uh, create for more variable and dangerous ice conditions, and could lead uh, to a decline in in cool water fish like the walleye, which is still a uh, you know a very sought after uh, game fish uh, in the Quarthas. Okay. So all of this uh, you know is very important. The changes we're seeing are the canary in the coal mine uh, of much bigger uh, threats coming our way. You know, we could be facing climate chaos like we saw last year in BC and this spring uh, in Ontario. It's all about preserving a healthy, climate safe world that's rich in biodiversity. It's about protecting our mental and our physical health. And it's also about uh, uh, safeguarding the ecosystem services that uh, human life depends on, safeguarding food and water pollination, flood control, erosion control, uh, cultural services such as our sense of place, beauty, inspiration, and to a very large degree, even our identity. You know, our identity is, is rooted in where we live. And, uh, um, you know, these changes are hard to see. Next, next slide. So the, uh, the big question, what can we do? Well, the big, <laughs> I like to think of what can you do, first of all, to cultivate hope? And I think really the best way to cultivate hope is by taking action, is getting involved. And also keeping in mind that we really never know just how the future is going to play out. But 
in a more concrete way, what do you do? Well, the number one action that experts in cl climate communication always uh, cite is the importance of talking about climate change with friends and family, within your clubs, organizations, connecting to people emotionally, talking about how climate change is affecting your hopes and dreams, the concerns you have for your kids and grandkids, but also talking about exciting solutions. It's important to spend time in nature, getting to know our local plants and, and animals, because the love of nature, getting a sense of what we stand to lose, inspires action. I think it's, in part, it's important to, uh, to demonstrate, to take part in public marches and protests. Also important to join a, a climate action group. Uh, there's so many of them, including for our grandchildren here in Peterborough. I think donating to environmental charities, too, is extremely important. Um, along the lines of talking about climate change, sharing climate news and posts on social media. And also doing what you can to influence how people vote. You know, encouraging friends and family to vote with climate and conservation top of mind, because government policy really is key. Next slide. And uh, this is really quite interesting. This is about charitable giving and showing support through uh, other actions. So climate change and protecting the environment is strong support across all generations when it comes to charitable giving. In fact, it's the number three cause that people give to. It's actually number one for uh, Gen Z, the 18 to 25 year olds. Number two for millennials, surprisingly number three for baby boomers, but only number six for uh, for Generation X, uh, 40 to 57 years old, which is um, interesting. And I'm not just sure what uh, what that's all about. But this, um, this study here uh, also showed um, a lot of openness to supporting climate change through other actions, including attending protests and in-person events, especially amongst uh, Generation uh, Z at 25%. And of course, taking ca the cause to social media. So uh, uh, just interesting information. Next slide. And we've just got a, about uh, two more left. So lots of reasons for hope. Um, we're seeing a huge political shift right now that really is ushering in aggressive uh, emission reduction laws. And this includes the European Gre uh, Green Deal, Canada's 2030 emissions reduction plan announced in the spring, the Inflation Re Reduction Act, the RIA in the US, and all of these should um, uh, be able to reduce it, emissions in their respective countries by 30 to 40% by 2030. We've just seen the election of pro-climate action governments in Australia and Brazil. Um, the energy market around the world is rushing like we've never seen before to renewable energy. The cost of renewables is plummeting, especially solar, down 85%. At the same time, the cost of fossil fuels is in many cases going up or is at the very least extremely volatile and certainly no longer seen as the future. The transition to renewable energy is looking much easier now than it did 10 years ago. Um, one thing that's really impressed me is the huge increase in climate change coverage by the media. What the CBC does around climate change is just so impressive. We're seeing a huge global awakening to how urgent the climate is in no small part, thanks to the role of young people like Greta Thunberg, but also de young people demonstrating right here in Peterborough. We're seeing huge leadership on the part of cities, especially Montreal, where I spend a lot of time. But uh, let's just remember that um, even though we appear to, at least right now, have dodged a worst case scenario of four to five degrees of warming, uh, two to three degrees of warming would still mean huge disruption and probably wholesale changes in how we live, you know, and we can go down the list of what that disruption is going to look like, new viruses, human migration, um, more and more extreme weather. But um, 
In my research, uh, the uh, consensus is that we should be able to adapt. We're going to be adapting to a changed world. Next slide. And a ton of things happening in Peterborough, so much around education and awareness, everything from for our grandchildren, Peterborough Public Health to uh, Camp Kawartha, so many organizations here involved in environmental and climate education, so much happening around land protection, and a lot of good things actually happening on the part of the city of Peterborough, some really good climate stuff in the official plan, um, organic waste composting coming online, electric charging stations, the green economy, uh, Peterborough Business Hub, the work being done around flood protection in the downtown. So, you know, we can always do more, but um, we should stop and recognize what's happening locally. Okay. Just some resources, uh, some websites um, that people may want to consult, everything from For Our Grandchildren to the Daily Climate. Uh, I love listening to these two podcasts, Outrage and Optimism and What on Earth, two excellent podcasts on, on climate change. I recommend reading the book, The Ministry for the Future by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson that really lays out a way forward uh, for humanity in facing the climate crisis. It's, um, it's really quite a, an interesting roadmap. And I've already talked about how uh, traditional media is really stepping up. Uh, and that even goes for the Peterborough Examiner, I'd say. It's quite something to see the amount of climate coverage in the Examiner. Okay. So what are the takeaway messages? That we are on course to exceed 1.5 uh, degrees of overall warming but probably will not get into the really dangerous zone of four to five degrees. We should be able to adapt and hopefully reinvent the way we live. However, this world of two to three degrees warmer will be a tumultuous world. By mid to late century, Peterborough may have the climate of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're seeing southern species moving north into the Kawarthas, some local species retreating uh, northward themselves, events happening earlier in the spring and fall, invasive, invasive species, poison ivy, ragweed and ticks are thriving, pollen levels climbing, and, um, you know, uh, somewhat uh, a fragile future for our forests, wetlands and lakes, but lots of reasons for hope. Just we need to just scale up the, the action that's taking place. We need to remember to talk about climate change, and we especially need to remember that we still have a, an extremely biodiverse, rich natural world in the core. There's so much out there to enjoy, and um, things are going to be different, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure moving forward, it's still going to be a, a wonderful place to live. That's what I've got. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Drew. Um, so let's go on to Dr. Monkman, or sorry, wow, Dr. Piggott. <laughs> go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, and uh, miigwech to Janet. Uh, the song at the beginning was beautiful to start us off. Really appreciate that. And Drew, thank you for such an enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, certainly comes across that you were a teacher. Um, I, uh, uh, if I didn't know it from your presentation, I might have known it from one of our staff who fondly recalled uh, being uh, one of your students. So I think you've had a, a lot of an impact on many people, some of whom have gone into public health, and I'm sure many others uh, care very much about our environment. So uh, thank you uh, for that presentation. Look forward to the discussion afterwards. Uh, folks, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, in detail about the health impacts of climate change. I'm going to share data, um, but I also want to tell stories. Um, I want to tell you specifically two stories, two potential future stories, and, and leave to you to reflect on which story we want to craft uh, and make for ourselves. It's something that I reflect on deeply and frequently uh, because I'm the father of two uh, little kids, two little girls, and uh, worry deeply 
deeply about the future that I have personally, but more importantly, that I am, we are leaving them in the next generation. And I think many people that uh, care deeply about our planet and about the climate emergency uh, recognize that the future is uncertain and, and it's scary. My uh, journey into, uh, before I uh, start uh, start sharing, sorry, this is my declarations of interest slide. Um, it's also available on our website uh, just to show I have no financial conflicts of interest and a number of other um, declarations. So if you go to our website and about uh, Peter Rowe Public Health, um, Medical Officer of Health, you can read it uh, more fully there. My journey to climate change, concern about climate change and climate action um, began quite a while ago now uh, when I was much younger. Um, and I uh, grew up listening to Kyoto Protocol discussions in the 90s. Uh, Kyoto Protocol was signed in 97. And I actually did, I don't want to date myself, but a school science fair project uh, shortly thereafter, looking at energy consumption and in particular looking at how solar cells could potentially be used for a number of household functions. Um, so from that early point, uh, I became very concerned with what I was hearing, with the climate emergency, with the direction, and I knew there must also be other ways forward. In my undergraduate degree, I actually did a research project exploring the impact of climate change uh, and what it was already having on Indigenous peoples, peoples living in Labrador, in South America, in Uganda, in locations already because of where they were and the life uh, they were living, experiencing early and dramatic impacts of climate change. Uh, the land was very important to them and their way of life. I learned more when I was medical officer of health um, in Labrador. And uh, there I heard firsthand the stories of how climate change was immediately impacting health. And one of the most uh, apparent, uh, the picture you're looking at here from the region that I served from Rigolette, Labrador, uh, was um, uh, that the uh, sea ice was thinning at alarming weights, rates. And passages that were once safe by dog sled originally in one day and now by snowmobile were no longer safe. Uh, people were falling through. People were dying uh, as a result of the changing climate. I also knew that waterborne diseases were becoming more risky than they used to be. And food security, a challenge uh, ever present in the north, had become more acute as traditional food sources uh, became uh, less readily accessible and increased costs of transporting food impacted health. But the climate emergency is something that I think has become more pressing as I've uh, had a family of my own and started reflecting on their future. So I want to share a fictitious story to get us thinking about the kind of world that we could be uh, leaving for them. So the year is later in the 2000s, um, later in the century. My daughter wakes up, you know, perhaps here in Peterborough, uh, wakes up early because the heat is unbearable. The latest brownout means that their cooling system hasn't worked for the past four days. This is a usual flux of electricity in this year. Uh, you can't count on it being there when you need it. My daughter gets up out of bed, heads down to the kitchen. In the kitchen, she starts preparing breakfast for her own kids and is realizing that, you know, the breakfast rations of oatmeal are running low and food security is a bigger concern and issue. There's nothing to go in the oatmeal. Um, perhaps uh, you used to be some apple and fruits, but with uh, changing um, uh, climate, the prized fruit tree they used to have in their backyard couldn't survive. She thinks at least I have this and I'm grateful for this, but she knows all over the world, other people may not have the same opportunity. There are wars waging over calories and, uh, you know, fortunately, Peterborough is currently at peace. After her breakfast, she gets her kids ready to go to school. It's extremely hot outside, so they uh, drive instead of walk. Fortunately, they got a precious liter of fuel um, the day before, but that's only going to be enough to get just to school and back. She gets her kids dressed in their full UV body protection suits. Uh, ever since another one of their family members succumbed from skin cancer, something all more common, and they get into their vehicle. On the way, they can't help but think about the risk of 
insects. And fortunately, their fall suits protect against other insects, Lyme disease being one of them. But perhaps other vector-borne diseases are prevalent now as well. Infections like malaria, once thought to be uh, you know, never possible to occur in a place like Peterborough. On their way outside, everyone dons their respirators, not to protect against infectious diseases like you would in a pandemic, but to protect against air pollution. The air is particularly bad with the warm weather today, and she knows it will further exacerbate her own kids' asthma. As she starts on the drive to school, she looks down the street. The storm that rolled through last week still means that trees are down on the road. There's floods from the last major flood that haven't receded from the month before. She'll have to take the long way to school. On the drive, her child, my grandchild perhaps, asks why the climate is this way. What happened to the days with greens and trees and the days of, of the planet like you had when you were a kid, mother? Why? Why? why and i say this because my oldest daughters entered the why question phase so she thinks she reflects the answer the simple answer to a really complex question is our addiction to fossil fuels and that we just couldn't break it not in time not quickly enough why 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 well i i don't know she says but it certainly wasn't because they didn't know where we were heading. We know where we're heading. And it's a complicated story because as much as our addiction to fossil fuels has had such a tremendous impact on our planet, it has actually brought about significant advances in things like health. The acceleration in our economy has increased life expectancy, it's decreased poverty, it's decreased child mortality. But the cost of using fossil fuels has come with these multitude of impacts on the environment, impacts on carbon dioxide, but other impacts on ocean acidification, tropical forest loss, deforestation, water use has exploded, the use of fertilizer, to uh, be able to increase food production, to meet the needs of the planet, the population we have now, uh, have increased dramatically. And the very worrisome part about this story and these changes, the negative impacts of using fossil fuels, is that they are a feedback cycle that is reinforcing and escalating itself. And so as human society continues to extract fossil fuels and continues to extract from our natural environment, it accelerates the impacts that we're seeing on climate change. And those are the changes like Drew discussed that we need to see reversed and that there is early hope, but not nearly enough to take pause and solace. Monthly temperatures will increase. In fact, they already have been increasing here in Peterborough. Um, if you haven't seen the website climatedata.ca, I'd strongly encourage you to look. You can search at uh, Peterborough and get finite detail. A lot of the data I'll present will be from there tonight. Uh, this is a slide Drew already showed, you know, looking at um, uh, the data from Community Climate uh, Change Resiliency Strategy. So temperature is a concern, um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. We're apt to see less cold days, more hot days. This impacts um, health, you know, cool nights can be quite dangerous. Sorry, warm nights can be quite dangerous um, uh, and, and extremely hot days can be uh, impactful as well. Last year, the heat dome in British Columbia cost nearly a thousand lives uh, in a span of just several weeks. And we know in Europe, the number was tens of thousands earlier this year in the corresponding heat um, uh, waves that uh, struck Europe. Uh, we anticipate that heat waves will be increasingly frequent um, and uh, you can see uh, nearly tripling of them in the Peterborough County uh, region as compared to the rare uh, event that it used to be just um, you know 20 or so years ago. 
Other impacts of uh, climate change include the extreme temperatures, extreme weather uh, that uh, Drew mentioned, uh, but also air quality related concerns. And I, I'm deeply concerned uh, about this. Uh, as of now, the impact on uh, lung diseases and heart diseases is significant. And uh, in fact, uh, perhaps more significant than events that we we suggest and link more closely, like smoking. Um, it's it's deeply concerning. Vector-borne diseases. We talked a bit about Lyme disease, but other uh, infections, uh, West Nile, uh, as an example, and others that we do not know perhaps will come here or emerge yet. This impacts health and this impacts our healthcare system. We are already seeing increased emergency department visits here in Peterborough as a result of heat illness as compared to decades previously. We are seeing uh, explosion in the number of uh, Lyme disease cases as it moves northward and other infections, some of which we don't have uh, you know, data that can really tell us, uh, but we do know are increasing in frequency and perhaps used to be much more rare. UV exposure is concerning, and we anticipate by the 2050s and later in the 20th, 21st century uh, that skin cancers will become far more prevalent as a result of UV exposure over this period. We talked a bit about uh, mental health, and this is, uh, uh, this is obviously uh, concerning. I'm going to just pause because I, uh, I understand that there's a uh, slide problem, um, perhaps. I don't know, Sarah, if uh, you can see, but um, I think you're the one that has the slides loaded. Can everyone else see the slides? I don't see them on the YouTube, so. Are they back? Oh. It looks hmm. like on YouTube they, they aren't displaying, no. It says reload to display presentation. Okay. Sorry, folks, bear with us. It's okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm reloading. It's going to take some time. I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> so as I was sharing, um, uh, the impact uh, of skin cancers is concerning and the impact of mental health. And I think both Mary Ellen and Drew referenced this. Um, but it's, it's um, potentially direct impacts, such as the impact of trauma when significant uh, storm and events uh, pass through. Uh, but it is also the longer term grief and anxiety, eco anxiety, sometimes it's termed as a result of the changes that we're observing. Okay, I think we're back. We saw the derecho and Drew spoke to it, um, was deeply uh, concerning in May, and I think signaled to us how much we have to do to start to get ready and how much we need to change our society and communities uh, to be ready. Power outages can have significant impacts on medication uh, storage, on the charging of devices such as mobility aids, and this can isolate people, in particular seniors or those um, people uh, with disabilities. Health system impacts uh, uh, are significant as well. Um, you know, our healthcare system currently, in the context of the pandemic and other respiratory viruses impacting children this fall is demonstrating crisis and does not have the resiliency to cope with more. We need to build better resiliency into the healthcare system. The human impacts will be broad. I've mentioned many of these already. But beyond that, they are complex. As much as I can tell you about what we are already seeing and what we may see, I cannot tell you for certain. And the uncertainty leaves me very concerned because if we uh, get the worst end of modeling predictions, the health impacts will be very significant. And over the next century, we may have issues with survival of the species or survival of people and populations in whole sections of our world. 
here in the Peterborough Public Health Region, we've assessed some of the changes and started to look at uh, vulnerability and ability of our populations and communities to adapt. I will come back to talking about how important this is and what we'll be doing soon. Um, to look at some of the populations that uh, uh, other regions have identified as highly vulnerable to climate change. This is drawing from work that Vancouver Coastal Health has done. And here in Peterborough, we'll be doing similar work, looking at specific priority populations. Uh, children are uh, higher sensitivity uh, to environmental issues and uh, could be quite concerning in the context of climate change. Uh, older adults um, uh, may experience more significant vulnerability in the context of heat and other environmental impacts. Um, people of lower income, uh, today I had the uh, opportunity to join with the uh, release of the um, Peterborough United Way, uh, the gap report on uh, income, and there are significant economic gaps uh, from people in particular who are um, not earning a living wage and are in uh, poverty as a result of minimum wage jobs, unemployment, uh, Ontario disability support, uh, old age security, and social security nets that are no longer supporting people. They will have less inherent ability to adapt than people with more means, with more resources. People with chronic conditions and illnesses experiencing mental health and addiction. People who are socially isolated. People who are Indigenous in particular. Um, and other uh, racialized populations, immigrant populations, will also um, experience more significant impacts of climate change. Pregnant people, um, people with disabilities, uh, outdoor workers and those uh, who are engaged in outdoor activities, uh, and of course those who have inadequate housing, will also impact uh, climate change uh, changes in a more significant, severe way. We have heard quite a bit from the provincial government on how important climate change is and how important it is to public health work. In fact, in the Ontario Public Health Standards, uh, there is now work that has been prioritized uh, and generally this has been prioritized for over a decade in public health and we have been doing work and we will be doing more work, especially as we recover some of our pandemic uh, impacted activities and work. The focus that I want to talk about and that we will be trying to place emphasis on for the work that public health will do is on uh, primarily adaptation. While we'll advocate and um, highlight the importance of mitigating or stopping some of the negative impacts uh, of climate change through reducing emissions, we also need to change society uh, in ways that can make us more resilient and less harmed by the impacts of climate change through adaptation. Here you can see the priorities that we have listed, uh, including working on our climate change and health vulnerability uh, and adaptation assessment uh, plan, uh, working collaboratively on emergency response so that events like the storm in May will have less significant impacts on people, especially higher uh, risk and more vulnerable populations. We need to escalate communications and impactful messaging about the climate emergency. And, and finally, and particularly, we want to relaunch and engage in climate change action in, with a particular attention to Indigenous-led activities. So what are some adaptation related strategies. Well, we can uh, be more ready for temperature fluctuations and changes. We can advocate for more cooling spaces. We can monitor extreme weather events and forecast and get people ready when they do hit. We can provide health and safety messaging during these events. We can monitor air quality and ensure that people who are at higher risk um, are aware and take measures to reduce their health impacts. We can support local policy development, especially around issues like food systems. We can um, you know, look at uh, sources of potential infectious disease, such as waterborne disease. We will continue to do outbreak investigations to respond to new and emerging outbreaks, public awareness and education, testing, and in particular, collaboration with community partners doing some of this work. The adaptations I'm talking about 
are not just nuisances that we should be thinking, well, I guess we should do those because of climate change. There are actually changes that will come with a lot of co-benefits, a lot of other benefits. Um, the health impacts of emissions directly on air quality from uh, fossil fuels is significant. And just doing that at a local level can dramatically improve air quality. Moving more towards active transportation can come with health benefits from exercise. And it's also really enjoyable. I love riding my bicycle. It's a lot of fun. And active transportation can be um, very beneficial from a health standpoint. So adaptation is not a nuisance, is not a pain. It comes with significant co-benefits. So I want to tell an alternate story to finish us off this evening. A different story. Again, we're later in the 21st century. My daughter wakes up. The temperature, it isn't so hot. We limited the temperature increases, like Drew mentioned was certainly possible. It has changed. Some change was inevitable, but we adapted to it. We prevented it from getting worse as it might otherwise have. So she gets up, she has a nice breakfast. Perhaps it's a bit different than the breakfast her own father had, but it's nutritious, it's delicious, it's grown locally, and it's through a food system that's adapted to changes. She gets out the door on her bicycle or perhaps takes an electric public transit network to get the kids to school. On the way, she takes in the beautiful wildlife in our beautiful region, including Peterborough's official bird. It's been allowed to thrive by a community and country that values the natural environment and the balance of our planet. At work, my daughter contributes to the economy around sustainability and making the planet a better place, perhaps because Peterborough had foresight and capitalized on it. A community that used to be impacted by the loss of industry saw an opportunity in the changes that we were experiencing and the opportunity to move society in positive directions. At our school, my grandchild learns about the natural world. She values it, contributes perhaps to a sustainable planet and existence. She doesn't have to be anxious about her future and the survival of our species and our planet because every decision that has been made has been made with the health of our planet in mind. So friends, in 2022, at this very moment, the survival and health of not only our community of Peterborough, our province, our country, but our species and our entire world is in jeopardy. There is no planet B. The decisions that we make will impact now which of the two stories I told this evening that we will ultimately live. I do not want you to go away from this evening's discussion to think that individual actions, you know, your own ability to ride your bicycle to work tomorrow are going to get us out of the problem that we're in and move us in the directions we need to go. Those individual actions are important. They may help. But what we really need are our leaders and every level of government to commit to real action, breaking our addiction to fossil fuels. I'm so happy that the city of Peterborough has declared a climate emergency, but actions speak heavier than words. What we need from government and what Peterborough Public Health is committed to is urgent action on the climate emergency. Our health and our planet's health depends on it. A few resources to leave you with. Thank you again for the opportunity to chat this evening and I very much look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Wow, that was amazing. So captivating to hear two different stories that way. So amazing. And it really puts things in perspective. Um, so if uh, my tech support friends here would help me to get rid of the PowerPoints, we can just have uh, our faces again. That would be great. And we have a little bit of time for questions, not a huge amount. So we're going to do our best. Um, I'll just give them a second to, to get that going for us. There we go. Looks good. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, some public questions that we got submitted. And I have a question. It's going to be for both of you, actually, to start. Um, so the question is, 
can you please give us two recommendations for individuals or communities, whatever you'd like to respond to, to help improve climate change and reduce health impacts locally? And we will start with Drew. I can read that again for you if you need to, just let me know if you need to hear it again. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted still, Drew. Can you hear me now? Yeah, all good. Yeah, so I touched on uh, on a number of things, but I would say that making climate change a regular topic of conversation, just the way we've done around COVID. We talked about COVID, there's still talk about COVID like we're all amateur epidemiologists. <laughs> so we need to all, <laughs> we don't need to be amateur climatologists. We just need to talk about, uh, especially at an emotional level, how, what are, what are our fears? What are our hopes? What are the uh, solutions? And uh, the second thing, too, um, voting influence, trying to influence how other people vote. And in addition to that, getting involved politically, uh, demanding that climate change be uh, a top issue at all levels, municipal, federal, uh, provincial. Um, and uh, anyhow, those are those are two or three that I think are very important. Yeah. All really good, really important things. Dr. Piggott, go ahead. Do you want me to repeat the question? Thank you, no. Um, and I, I think Drew's were brilliant. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll compliment them or I'll um, go with those and add in. Um, I think, uh, you know, to take a page out of the, the uh, wisdom Drew was sharing with us this evening, we need to get out and experience nature and learn and love what we have to lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from a health standpoint, I think that we uh, should be thinking and looking out for those who are perhaps a bit more vulnerable um, uh, to health impacts of climate change. Drew, you brought up COVID, not me, um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll go there. With COVID, though, uh, you know, we did uh, know that uh, the pandemic impacted those more vulnerable more than some others. Um, similarly, climate change will, but it will impact us all just as the pandemic has impacted all of our health and and so i think that trying to identify strategies to to make yourself more ready for future storms future changes uh, are important and as a community we need to be starting these conversations so that if we get a derecho storm again um, a senior's apartment building isn't left for days without electricity, leaving people vulnerable. Um, if the temperature had have been more extreme at that time, we may have seen loss of life as a result of uh, the loss of power there. We need to create uh, adaptation strategies to be ready. So I think we need to be starting those community conversations. Some of them are political. We need to make sure our leaders um, uh, and those we elect are doing that. But uh, I think that there are also conversations we can start as a community. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, do we have any media here with us tonight in, the, in my little Zoom Teams meet? If you are media and you have a question, please um, raise your hand for me here. I do see Global on the line. Global, did you have any questions for us? Might just be listening in. Okay, well, that's fine. We'll keep going. Um, just wanted to give the opportunity. We do only have a couple minutes left. Um, okay, so I have another question that's for both of you, actually. Um, so someone from the public is wondering, climate change is affecting not only our physical health, but also our mental health, which both of you did talk about a little bit. Can you suggest how eco-anxiety and eco-grief can be best addressed and alleviated without denying the truly existential threat of climate change to the future on young people? And uh, let's start with Dr. Piggott this time. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Mary Ellen. Um, so eco-anxiety is, is uh, very much a phenomenon. It's been well studied. There's a lot of articles that have now come out about this. In a survey I recently reviewed, uh, they had found that 
Um, 84% of respondents were at least moderately worried and nearly 60% were very or extremely worried about the anticipated health effects of climate change. And that was an international survey uh, across uh, a dozen countries. The, uh, the impact on people, in particularly young people, is very real. So I think to your uh, question, the very first thing we need to do is not deny uh, its existence or minimize it. Uh, we need to hear and listen to that anxiety. I think, um, you know, uh, there are strategies, obviously, if something spills into um, a significant mental health issue that is impacting somebody's daily function in life, they should be seeing their primary care provider who can help and support with treatment. Um, however, generally for people, I think channeling uh, that sentiment into action and activating um, uh, can be very helpful uh, to channeling uh, that anxiety towards seeing uh, change and seeing progress. So both at the individual level uh, to get involved, uh, to participate in social activism, uh, to uh, participate in activities that impact our climate in a positive way, I think can be therapeutic. Uh, but also, if we really want to respond to the eco-anxiety that young people are facing, societally, we need to do more about climate change. It's quite simple. Yeah, definitely. Um... I can attest to getting involved, being helpful with that, definitely. Um, Drew, do you have a very fast response <laughs> before we wrap up here? Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think we really need to normalize talking about climate change and talking about climate change with kids. Kids are really a lot more resilient than, uh, than we think. We talk to them about things like divorce, you know, and they can, they can cope with these things. And the same with climate change. Um, certainly, uh, you know, asking them how they feel, what they're concerned about, uh, giving, the, uh, giving them ways to take action, if, if only to, you know, improve their own uh, uh, emotional well-being. I think taking action, especially for kids, is extremely therapeutic. Maybe attending uh, uh, a climate event as a, as a family, pointing out the successes, pointing out uh, all of the changes that are happening, how people like Greta Thunberg have had uh, such uh, such an impact. Talking to you, your students' teachers and ask ask the teacher, you know, are, is this being discussed in the classroom? I know at the provincial curriculum level, uh, there's not much happening that I'm aware of, and it's it's going to take a while. But I think your your child's teacher can can bring this up in the classroom, and that that is if I. <laughs> Uh, you know, if my kids were still in elementary, even high school, that's one of the things um, I would be doing. And as Dr. Piggott said, uh, spending time in nature and giving kids a sense of how wonderful it is, what stands to be lost, and what we can do to protect it. And there's there's a lot that we can do. Awesome. All right. Um, and then the last question that's going to be really fast before I wrap up, I was just wondering if either of you wanted to touch on on COVID a little bit and and more like, do you have an, a sense of how that might go into the future with climate change, if we're going to see more infectious diseases, how that might look, or is that really, really uncertain uh, at this time? And I don't know if Drew might also have some insights from the naturalist perspective on that. And Dr. Piggy, if you want to go first. Oh, I can certainly start. Uh, so I worked in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, a country afflicted with multiple uh, Ebola outbreaks. Ebola is a zoonotic uh, virus. It's a virus that jumps from uh, bats and other species to humans. A lot of viruses, including potentially uh, COVID-19, the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2, uh, um, originate in animals. And uh, when they looked at the West Africa Ebola outbreak, uh, the origins of it were likely because of deforestation, encroachment of humans into animal um, uh, communities, and then closer interaction of uh, bats, monkeys, uh, other species with, um, uh, with humans. And so this uh, impact, the deforestation and negative impacts that we're seeing uh, from uh, the uh, impact that we're having on our own climate is accelerating the introduction of new zoonotic 
viruses into our human population. And we have been, if you track over the last couple of centuries, seeing an acceleration of new viruses being introduced and impacting uh, humans. So I think that it is uh, quite concerning with COVID-19 specifically. I'm not sure where we will go. It's still with us. Um, uh, and I believe that we'll be uh, fighting it for some period of time. But what I do know is that the continued emergence of new infections is deeply troubling. And uh, I anticipate it will continue to increase in coming uh, years. So we need to do more on the climate so that we can help uh, prevent these as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so fascinating. I didn't know that about Ebola. Wow. The last thing, uh, and I can send an article for that uh, study, it was in Nature. Um, the last thing I'll say, though, on this is to me, COVID-19 provides a perfect example of hope. And perhaps that's my last word before I pass to, to you and Drew. Um, I think that we have had a tremendous mobilization of the community around protecting ourselves from COVID-19. We recently did an analysis and we estimated nearly 300 lives may have been saved because of the collective action of people in our very own Peterborough Public Health Region community to come together and take action against COVID-19. If we can do this for a virus, I fully believe we can do this to protect ourselves and our planet. Thank you so much. That's strong words to end on. Drew, do you have anything that you'd like to add on, on that subject? I'm sorry, but I got uh, disconnected somehow right oh. at eight. So I, I, did, I missed the question. Oh, no worries. I was just asking if you guys had any final thoughts on how COVID relates to climate change and how that might uh, look going into the future. Uh, yeah, well, I would certainly agree that uh, our response to COVID, despite all of the, the many, many hiccups, really has been phenomenally impressive, <laughs> I think, uh, given that uh, we never, we didn't have a dry run, a practice run a, a ahead of time. Um, <laughs> you know, I would just say that uh, it shows our resilience, you know, we uh, we accepted, accepted some pretty dire measures vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID, and I would like to think that, uh, you know, we can step up and, uh, and uh, accept maybe a little bit of disruption, too, with climate change and accept policies, you know, for example, the, the carbon tax and, and, and start uh, seeing these things as positives and embrace them and demand that uh, our political leaders get on the same page and quit politicizing, uh, you know, an existential, existential uh, threat. And we got on the same page for the most part around COVID, at least in Canada. And, um, you know, we need to do the same thing. It's so frustrating that it's still a political issue in so many quarters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. Um, okay, that is all the time we have for questions. I would love to sit here and talk to you guys all night about climate change and COVID and all these things, but we got to let people go uh, carry on with their nights. So I would just like to say before we go, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, especially to our speakers, to Dr. Piggott and to Drew and to Janet for all they did to make this night great. You guys are the reason we're here. So thank you. We truly couldn't have done it without you. Thank you, of course, to For Our Grandchildren and to Peterborough Public Health for all of your hard work organizing. This was a joint effort and it was a pleasure to collaborate with the health unit. Thank you to Public Health again for your technical support and all the health advertising and all of these things that you did with us. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in at home on YouTube for watching, for supporting, for being concerned citizens in this community, uh, showing up to talk about these important things. And uh, the, ad, the email address should be up on the screen for you, or maybe it's not. If it's not, um, maybe we didn't make that happen. That's it, okay. It will be. It will, it be. will be. Okay, awesome. So the email address, if your question was not asked tonight and you would like it to be answered, um, you can direct it to contact us at forgrandchildren.com. That email address will be up on your screen shortly, and we will direct it accordingly to either the health unit or to Drew to answer. Um, so we hope that tonight provided some useful insights, some new information maybe, and some inspiration to take action. Speaking of taking action, one of the most important things we can do to address climate change is talk about it, as Drew said, as Dr. Piggott said, 
Um, so if you've been inspired tonight to take some action against climate change, we would love to have you at For Our Grandchildren. Um, if you're not already a member, you can always join us, check out our website. We also have social media on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, if you don't already have the public health unit on uh, social media, you should do so. They post really important updates and you can also check out their website to stay up to date on public health. So thank you so much once again to everybody involved, to everybody watching, and I hope you all have a great rest of your evening and a rest of your week. <laughs>